Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Young from Optrix Engineering. And with me, I have Sean Sturby, our Technical Services Manager. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Scott. And this is another edition of the Optrix Insider. Today's three topics are interesting. Well, they always are, but this one includes something that I hadn't heard of before or even considered, I should say. First one is JBS paid $11 million in ransomware. And from what you say, not to get their data back. So no. that Okay, so that'll be interesting. Fastly outage knocked the internet offline for a bit. And then this one is going to be interesting. Zoll defibrillators dashboard has an advisory. Usually we don't talk about medical uh, devices, but I guess we will this week. Let's start off with JBS who paid $11 million in for uh, ransomware. So on June 9th, uh, they posted a statement that they paid the equivalent of $11 million in ransom, not because they wanted to get their data back, because they said at the time that they paid their ransom, they were mostly up and running. They are using best practices. So they had things backed up and they were able to restore from those backups very quickly and professionally. So that was great. The problem was that the ransomware uh, I, I want to call them companies, but they're they're not companies, although they run like big business. Uh, the ransomers had exfiltrated a bunch of data. And so the ransom paid was so that the ransomers would not release it publicly. So that's what they paid for. They, uh, they didn't pay to get a decryption key to get their data back. They paid so that the information would be kept private. Now, uh, do, you, do you trust that the ransomer is going to not release your data or not come back? You can get into a very interesting philosophical discussion that if you've been a victim once, you'll be a victim again, but. What I'm hearing then is that normally when you get hit by ransomware, you'll get some sort of screen that basically says your device is locked. And in order to unlock it, you have to pay usually Bitcoin and they'll tell you the amount and where to send it. And then once you pay it by a certain amount of time, by a deadline, then they'll give you the necessary key or whatever to unlock your data. Now, what I'm hearing then is that JBS was able to restore their system without getting the key because they had backups and correct, which is usually one of the suggestions that we have. And there's a number of different ways to do it, providers. And if you're like, like Unitrends or uh, there is another one that we use that escapes me, but Veeam does backups and all sorts of stuff. Anyways, if you have backups and you can usually roll back to the point where before the infection, in this case, what you're saying is, so they were able to do that, recover everything without having to pay the ransom. But then the other part to ransom is, well, we also have your data. And if it's, if it's important enough to you, you're going to have to pay for us not to release it on the dark web or, or publicly. That, and that could, could be competitive data that uh, one of their competitors would love to have. Interesting. And they're like... <laughs> Really, unfortunately, the hackers have a lot of control here. And, and then do you trust a thief? Probably not, but you, you kind of wonder what assurances they had to build into that. But perhaps you can uh, expand on who is JBS? What kind of industry are they in? JBS Foods. They're a manufacturer of lots and lots of different uh, foods. Uh, the brands that they have are things like Swift, Pilgrim, Primo, uh, Aberdeen Black, Organic Acres, or Acres Organic, Aussie Beef, Blue Ribbon Beef, Country Pride, Clear River Farms, Canadian Diamond, Black Angus. Hmm. So they got lots of different uh, brands. Uh, the notice that they sent out said that they spend you know, $200 million annually on IT and employs more than 850 IT professionals globally. So they are a really large company. Wow. So an $11 million uh, ransom compared to their $200 million uh, annual IT budget 
is pretty small. It's a significant portion, 5% or 5.5%, five but right. it's still, it's not like a, they're a tiny little company and the $11 million is all of their uh, profit for multiple years. Well, it was certainly a business decision on their part. <clears throat> it's still 11 million is 11 million. It's a lot of money, but uh, even with a $200 million IT budget, they still got caught, which is unfortunate, of course. And interesting that if they're in the food business, I'm sure they've got some secret recipes or obviously the ransom uh, where hackers, providers, whatever you want to call them, was able to get something that was worth at least $11 million to JBS. So uh, interesting lesson there. Anything else you'd like to have or discuss on that? Uh, it's just, we're going to see more and more of this as the companies have realized that the ransomers are encrypting their data. So the way to resolve it is to make sure you have good offsite backups. And so the ransomers are pivoting. Well, yeah, not only did we encrypt your data, but we kept a copy for ourselves. And instead of paying for the safe return of your data, you can pay for the safe non-return of your data. <laughs> <laughs> we will oh, shred it. Man. man, oh man, that's definitely just... want to get. Uh, you know, in their case, they got the FBI involved, but you definitely want to have some big brains involved in any of those negotiations to get your information back. Yeah, and I just want to point out that, of course, if you do not have any form of backup, let us know. Uh, I did a great interview with the folks at Unitrends, which I, I will post a link to, which explains certainly how to recover from a, a ransomware attack. And I'll, of course, you can contact us at optrix.com and uh, we can talk about your situation and, and provide you with some suggestions on what backup tools you can use. Let's move on to the Fastly outage knocked the internet offline for a bit. Yeah, so quite often we hear, oh, Google was down, so the internet was down, or Facebook was down, so the internet was down. Have you ever heard of Fastly before as a big brand? Uh, no, I haven't. Well, there are three big brands, uh, Fastly, Akamai, and uh, Cloudflare. And they are all providers of what are called content delivery networks or CDNs. Right. So the idea behind it is that uh, you've got a very popular website and A, you want it to be robust and handle millions of hits. And so that's what these content delivery networks do. They have local caching servers. So uh, in every city around the world, they'll have a point of presence, every large city that is. And when you, your computer says, I want to go to Facebook. Well, they won't go directly to one data center or one server at Facebook headquarters. Through the magic of the internet, the, the, your lookup will find, oh, there's a copy of this information locally here in your city. So it's nice and quick and you get it, it uh, a very effective and very uh, responsive web interface and web experience. Problem is, uh, these content delivery networks were down to three majors, uh, the three that I mentioned earlier, and something happened on their deployment. And because so many other companies are using it, uh, they talked about Reddit and Spotify, the New York Times, the Wired.com, there was a lot of them that just went away briefly for about an hour as the, uh, Fastly resolved their issue. And it was a worldwide disruption. So big kudos to Fastly for figuring out that there was a problem very quickly and figuring out how to resolve it very quickly and then how to fix the problem that had been lurking uh, for about a month when they published a, a software fix that a... So the customer deployed what they considered a reasonable or a valid configuration change to, which it caused a, a triggered this outage or service degradation across all of their points of presence. So your internet connection was working fine. The root DNS servers and all of the other DNS servers that look things up when you go, hey, I want to get to Facebook or Wired or the New York Times, those all worked. 
it was just that these content delivery networks are a bit of a man in the middle. They sit between you, your computer, and these actual providers of the content so that things are quicker for you. But when they break, it goes down in a bad way. Sounds like it. Now, one other thing with CDNs that's worth mentioning, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, of course, is that one of the ways that hackers and those with ill intent, I should say, uh, mess with some uh, with an organization's website specifically is that they'll send a denial of service attack. Correct. Which basically means is that they harness the power of a bunch of computers and they'll they'll all get them to bombard your website more requests than that that they can handle and it just slows either slows things down or, or bring things down to a crashing halt it's the same thing if say the government during covid uh announced because of all the the shutdowns that every everyone who lost their job could apply for a government benefit and then everybody at the same time gangs up on the website to sign up and then of course nobody can get access to it because the website is down due to such a large volume of traffic yes now the 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 benefit of the content delivery network, the CDNs, is that if you are experiencing a denial of service attack, or if you expect that the traffic on your website is going to suddenly spike because of, for whatever a legit reason or not, they're able to help mitigate that Correct. by distributing the load. Yep. And another thing that they do is uh, called web application firewall. Another way that hackers constantly try and take over websites is that they will try and find a flaw in how the website is built. Uh, we see it constantly. People are trying to log into our websites and are being denied and blocked and all of the other technology that's around that you know, keeps blocking people from trying to log in with the default usernames and passwords. So it's doing what its job. These content delivery networks also take that to the next level with a web application firewall. So they, because they're sitting between the requests and the actual origin server, they're able to inspect that and go, oh no, this request doesn't look legit. We can block it, mm -hmm. protecting you. Yeah, so that, they're definitely, uh, um, I'm familiar with the, the most with Cloudflare, but a lot of, I think through, cPanel, you can attach your account to, for hosting your website, you can attach it to Cloudflare, make that whole process easy. So it, it just mm -hmm. gives you some uh, good stability and, and protection on your website. And there's free versions and, and, and uh, paid versions. One other thing that I just wanted to point out is a lot, we've talked about WordPress in previous episodes, and it's probably one of the world's most popular free content delivery site. It's open source and, and therefore it's a large, uh, has a big target on its back. And of course the it has plugins and they're constantly updating and, and the, the backend is updating uh, itself quite a bit. One of the number one, if we're going to offer a security tip is that there are plugins that because there's a common place to log into WordPress, is, and this is a self-hosted version, is they'll, they'll target the login page and some people don't change the uh, admin login. So they'll just say admin admin or something like that. So obviously change the user to something other than admin and use a strong password. But the other thing is they have plugins that can do this is change the login page. So really hackers don't know where to go to log in. But uh, anyways. I can uh, include some links to that too, but just a pro tip on WordPress. Anything else on Fastly or shall we move on? Uh, not specifically on Fastly, but um, it really is mostly behind the scenes that these things work so well. Uh, we mentioned Cloudflare. They had a, a bunch of outages recently and most of these providers actually have a uh, status page. So you can go in and see, yes, it's working all across the country except in xyz location so kudos to fastly akamai cloudflare all of these content delivery networks for making our experience on the internet so much better but we are putting all of our eggs in one basket sure 
and their selling point is you're not really putting all your eggs in one basket because we're so distributed. <laughs> but of course, if the system goes down, then that doesn't yeah. work out well. Huge redundancies failed them. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, let's talk about Zoll defibrillators, which have a dashboard, and that dashboard has an advisory. Yeah, so the um, there's a U.S. government CISA advisory. Um, ICS is a term talking about uh, internet connected devices. So what they've released, the government has released is that the vendor Zoll has a defibrillator dashboard. So we know what a defibrillator is. That's uh, what the doctors and the paramedics use to get somebody's heart to restart if they're experiencing a heart attack. So this is a dashboard of some sort and it sounds like uh, it might be something that you can update so that it's quite uh, possibly that it's maybe for a hospital where they have you know lots and lots of these defibrillators and you just have one central location to manage and, and monitor them all. Uh, they do warn you that uh, always look at the actual defibrillator and not the dashboard for the most up-to-date. So uh, they've already provided a fix, but I'll just read through the things, the vulnerabilities that were found. Uh, an unrestricted upload of files with dangerous type. Use of a hard-coded cryptographic key. Clear text storage of sensitive information cross-site scripting, storing passwords in a recoverable format, and improper privilege management. Sounds very scary, but all it means is that uh, they didn't take uh, a stance that security is more important. And when you're dealing with something in the health industry, you know, making sure that it is providing accurate and clear and understandable information to the doctor who's making that split second decision, life or death decision is more important, but that doesn't mean that security should not be thought about. So it sounds like, uh, and this is uh, countries deployed worldwide, even though they're headquartered in, in the U, uh, United States. So update to version 2.2 or later, and uh, they've got a 1-800 number where you can get a hold of Zoll to get that latest update. This is interesting to me. Uh, I'm a volunteer ski patroller and I'm trained on uh, defibrillators, well, the automated kind. Those are the portable ones that, that you'd often see in a shopping mall on the wall. That is someone who's going to the mall, has heart attacks. Anybody should be able to train in it, should be able to grab it and use it. My understanding is even for the ones in the field, they, the, your local health authority wants them back because they'll take data off of it. And they use that data, the telemetry to make decisions on uh, CPR procedures and that type of thing. I would imagine the reason why the ones, the ones, so those are the, the, the portable ones. The ones you're most likely talking about are the ones in the hospitals in the uh, operating room or the emergency ward. You know, the ones where they rub them together and then they say clear, uh, is that they want to gather all the information on the situation to, to diagnose it. This really underscores why uh, devices that you wouldn't think about. And we've talked about printers and fridges and toasters, anything that's connected to the internet, people don't think of making sure they're updated or, or protected to some way. And there was that HP video, I'm not sure if it's still available with Christian Slater in it called The Wolf, if I remember correctly. Yes. And, and he showed, he played the role of a hacker and he showed how he was able to get into a company and take control of the network through the uh, an ins unsecured printer. And if I can find it, I'll include a link to that. But uh, I can see if if these AED or defibrillator, defibrillators, not an AED, just a defibrillator, are insecure, how that would be a, a big open door for a hacker to have access to a, a hospital. Mm -hmm. And we, and which is unfortunate because really 
the purpose of the hospital is to keep people alive and to solve problems. The last thing you want is a hacker to shut the network down just because of an insecure device. Yeah. So in addition to making sure that you update to the latest version, there was uh, three other very quick recommendations. One of which was uh, anything like this that is critical, ensure that they're not accessible from the internet, isolate them from the business network. And if remote access is required, use a secure method. Mm -hmm. I think there was even a Grey's Anatomy episode once uh, a while ago where they had a hacker access the system and shut things down. So it does happen. I, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you included this topic, Sean, this week, just because it underscores how there's so many different ways hackers can get at, at that your can get access to your network that it makes your head spin. Wow. Anything? I'd be interested in that one. Yes, yeah, thank you. Anything else on that topic? Oh, nope, nothing on that one. Okay. A any of closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, just that next week is going to be interesting as we're going to take a look at the uh, credentials that were stolen from. Amazon, Google, and Facebook over the last number of years, 26 million credentials. So it'll be an interesting topic for next time. I bet, okay. Scary stuff out there. Thank you as always, Sean, for your insight, and keeping your ear to the ground. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share, like, and subscribe and leave a comment. We'd love that. Smash that like button. Have a great week. We will see you again. Bye for now.